OK. Right, so as I said, I want to talk about a grand challenge within a very grand challenge. So the very grand challenge is developing a fundamental understanding of the feedback between structure and function in the brain. How does structure of the brain influence its function, and what sort of feedback does the function or the activity in the brain have on the changes in the structure of their brain? Because your brain is plastic. It doesn't keep the same structure the whole time. It's modifying its structure as you learn. And we'd like to know more about how this feedback loop works. So this is a very grand challenge. And the grand challenge within that, which has been the project of the, the Blue Brain Project for over 10 years now, is digital reconstruction of brain models that can capture as much of this structure and function as possible. And so it's, a, again, an iterative process and uh, constantly improving this particular model. So that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. And uh, the tool that's being developed in this process of answering this grand challenge is what you might call digital neuroscience. It's a kind of a new field of neuroscience, which is at the confluence of neuroscience, computer science, and increasingly, mathematics, and a wider and wider range of mathematics as well. And so my background, as was mentioned, is in algebraic topology. And I'm going to tell you today something about how algebraic topology enters into this story of uh, neuroscience. So, oopsie, I went a little bit too far. Okay. So I want to talk about how we go from neuroscience to this field of algebraic topology. So let me remind you a bit about neuroscience, right? So your brain is made up of hundreds of billions of neurons, nerve cells, that are communicating among themselves mostly by electrical signals that are usually carried by, transmitted through chemical synapses that transport from the axon of one neuron to the dendrites of another neuron. And what we see here is a sort of an artist's rendering of these sorts of connections across synapses between different neurons. And so your brain has these hundreds of billions of neurons and hundreds of trillions of synapses. So it's an incredibly complex structure that one is trying to understand here. And what we want to do is try to come up with some sort of simplification of the structure that still keeps enough of the information that we have a reasonable model, but is still something that we can actually analyze. So what I'm going to explain is how we go from this very complex picture that was the previous image that I was showing you to algebraic topology. So how this kind of graph uh, or constellation, one might think, could be capturing some of the important information about the structure and also the function of these neocortical microcircuits. So, oops, I don't know why this is ending up, this is sort of shifted. Does anybody know how I could fix this? Because we're missing part of the top of it. Anyway. If we try to understand the human brain, as I said, it's composed of hundreds of billions of neurons and hundreds of trillions of synapses, that's an incredibly complex problem. So let's simplify life and think about the rat brain instead. So the neocortex of the rat, the part of the brain that's involved with higher functions, cognition and so on, is very similar, has a similar kind of structure to that of the human brain. So it's a reasonable approximation to consider. And it's also, you know, something that is uh, some, perhaps easier to model because it's a lot a lot smaller. We're talking about numbers of neurons in the order of hundreds of millions, and numbers of synapses or connections between them on the order of hundreds of billions. So we've reduced the scale of the problem somewhat. And so the idea is that if by understand, we can first try to understand this rat model, and then move on, perhaps, we hope, to understanding the human model better. It's kind of a warm-up exercise, a detailed and complex warm-up exercise. So, Let's think about the rat brain. So this is roughly the number of neurons and synapses that we have in the rat brain. It weighs about 2 grams as opposed to 1.2 kilograms for a human brain. But its neocortex, the part of the brain that we're interested in because it's related to these higher functions, it still has this sort of six-layer structure, but which I'm going to talk more. There's still very, a great diversity of neurons and connections between neurons and so on. And so the goal, the motivating philosophy of the Blue Brain Project, is to try to build some kind of a digital model of the rat neocortex, not only to recapture its structure, but also its function. And we want to be able to analyze this and learn some lessons that maybe we can then carry on to thinking about the human brain. So, oops. So the problem is, this, this is not just a big data problem, it's a big data problem. It's a huge data problem. 
we look at a few of the numbers that are associated to the information that has to go into building some sort of model of the brain, depending on exactly how much information you want to take into account, it becomes a problem that seems like way, way out of scale. So how can we possibly do this? So the question we have to ask is what data do we really need in order to carry out the sort of digital modeling of the brain? So fortunately for us, the brain is highly organized. We have a, it's a very organized structure. And if it weren't, we wouldn't be capable of learning anything. If you weren't born with a brain that was already incredibly complex, already highly structured, it'd be very difficult for you to learn anything. You'd spend your whole life learning very elementary things. So, so we have a very high degree of organization, high degree of redundancy, which is very helpful to us because that means you don't actually have to capture everything about the brain and measure everything about the brain in order to model it properly. If you had a completely random system, you just knew that there was a certain probability, for example, in this picture that a pixel was either white or black, then to know exactly what was going on at a particular pixel, you actually have to measure it. Whereas in the brain, you can, because of this structure, you don't have to measure every single thing in order to know a lot about it. So we have to choose carefully what it is that we measure in order to come up with a reasonably good approximation of the structure. We don't actually have to measure absolutely everything. So I want to talk to you in more detail about what, is, what this blue brain model is. So what they've done is to make a digital reconstruction of part of the brain, part of the cortex, of a very young rat, a 14-day-old rat. This is about a sensory cortex, which would be roughly here if I were a rat. So it's part of the cortex that's involved with primary analysis of sensory information that's coming in from the inside through the thalamus to this part of the brain, and then decides where to send the signals elsewhere to the motor cortex, farther into the sensory cortex, and so on. So the idea was to make a digital reconstruction, uh, on, a com reconstruction on computer of this microcircuit, and then not just to have its structure, but also its function. And what you'd like to be able to do is simulate both spontaneous and evoked activity. Spontaneous meaning, you know, any, even if you're not actively learning or doing something, your brain is always active. There are always the neurons that are firing and just sort of preparing the way for any incoming signal that might come in. If your brain were completely quiescent at any moment, when an input signal came in, you wouldn't, it would take too long to react. But because your brain is sort of always exploring its state space, it's more ready to accept and interpret incoming input. So there's a spontaneous activity that's going on because your brain is floating in this uh, cerebral spinal fluid which has calcium ions in it. But then there's evoked activity when you have some kind of incoming stimulus to which the circuit is going to respond. So what we have to do is figure out how to simulate this kind of activity on the structure. So you build the structure and then you're going to simulate the activity. So in more detail, what goes into this reconstruction? I'll give you a little bit of detail. There's a, a long and beautiful article that was published in Cell two years ago that explains in great detail what was involved. But five different rats were sacrificed at the age of 14 days about 10 years ago, and various information was collected about these rats. So there were Samples taken from the, the slices taken from the brains of these rats in the somatosensory cortex. And if we look at the somatosensory cortex again, so it has these six layers from the outer layers to the deeper layers like this. And so in all of these different layers, they looked at the thickness of the layers, the proportions of the different kinds of cells. There are lots of different kinds of cells, lots of different morphological types. So types would have different kinds of shapes, different kinds of electrical behavior, and so on and what their densities were in these different layers. One thing that is very important about this model is it takes into account not just the average morphology, the average shape of the neurons, but actually precise neuron morphologies, the exact shapes of these morpho morphologies, and the connection probabilities that are determined by really these precise shapes. So they're not just sort of average shapes of the neurons and average connection probabilities. It's really a very explicit sort of construction. Then there's certain complex and but biologically motivated organizing principles that are used to determine the exact placements of the cells and then how uh, superfluous connections are pruned away. So in the end, given these input data, they were put into a stochastic uh, algorithm that then recreates an entire 
microcircuit here. So a microcircuit built of roughly 31,000 neurons that form roughly 8 million connections. So what do you mean by connection? If you have two neurons that are connected by, say, just one synapse from the axon of one to the dendrite of the next, that's not a very reliable connection because the synapse isn't always going to transmit the signal. We consider the two neurons are connected if there's actually several synapses that they share so that you have a more reliable transmission of signal from one to the other. So that's what we mean by a connection between two neurons. So each connection is composed of several synapses, which is why in this reconstructed microcircuit, you have roughly 37 million synapses that are connecting these 31,000 neurons. So this is a very big network, but it's actually just a little piece of a little part of the brain of the rat. So because this reconstruction algorithm is actually stochastic, it doesn't give the same result every time you use the same input parameters. So input parameters are coming from this data that was collected, and you use these same input parameters, you're not necessarily going to get exactly the same thing. So there were seven of these microcircuits that were reconstructed from each of the five rats, and then the input parameters, we took an average of the input parameters, and they were used as input to create seven sort of average microcircuits as well, giving a total of 42 different instantiations of these microcircuits which can be studied in different ways. And so one question one can ask is, how different are the seven microcircuits that are created from the parameters from one individual rat? Are they similar to each other? How different are they compared to the microcircuits that come from the parameters from a different rat? There are all sorts of questions one can ask like that. Once these microcircuits were reconstructed, there were various uh, experiments that had been done in vivo or in vitro that were then reproduced in silico, often very well, without tuning any parameters. So certain experimental data was used as input to the creation of the microcircuit, and then other experimental data was used for validation afterwards. And if anybody's interested in seeing exactly how the connectivity of these networks look like, you can go online, and the matrices that describe the connections between the individual neurons is actually publicly available now. Now, anybody can play with it. So I want to give you a little more detail about what these neurons actually look like. So I said there's actually quite a lot of diversity of different shapes of neurons in the circuit. So these are called these morphological types. And basically, the neurons are divided into two types. They're inhibitory ones. We were talking about inhibitory and cytatory earlier today as well in another context. So the inhibitory neurons that are you know, there to tamp things down, sort of like the police that come at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, you need to turn down the music. And the excitatory neurons that say, yeah, let's have a party, right? We're getting things going. So there are many, there's a greater variety of inhibitory neurons than of excitatory neurons in terms of morphologies. But the excitatories make up about 80% of the neurons in the network, and the inhibitories about 20%. So one takes into account these 55 different morphological types, which here are sorted by layer, when reconstructing the microcircuit. So, and as I said, not just the specific morphological type, but even the precise shape within a type that's taken into account. But it's not just the shape that counts. The electrophysiology is also important. How exactly signals are transmitted, how well they are transmitted, and so on. Because even for one particular morphological type, you can have quite a large variety of electrophysiology that shows up. So here, for example, on the left-hand side, we have different kinds of electrical types. So this is showing how the cells will react to an incoming current, what the output looks like with a different, with, in response to the same incoming current. And what we see on the right-hand side is that one specific morphological type, in this case, it's a particular type of inhibitory cell called a basket cell, you can have different kinds of electrical behavior. So that once you take into account the complexity of morphological and electrical behavior, you have a tremendous diversity of cell types, even within this little piece of the cortex. So here's how the workflow goes for reconstructing the whole microcircuit. So we have the 55 different morphological types of neurons. And in real life, in an actual brain, if you have the same morphological type, you have quite a diversity of specific shapes within a morphological type. So in order to capture some of that, and because there's only a small number of actually reconstructed neurons available, there's a sort of cloning that goes on to perturb the shapes of the neurons slightly. So you get some kind of morphological diversity. These are then placed within the microcircuit according to a specific algorithm, and, you know, just sort of chosen randomly 
specific morphologies for the different morphological types. And then the connectivity is reconstructed, starting with the fact that a neuron and an, ac sorry, an axon and a dendrite have to approach each other within three microns for there to be any chance of there being a synapse connecting them. But if all of those possible touches actually did become synapses, there'd be way, way too many in the microcircuit. So one has to prune them away. And there's a four-step pruning process, which I'll mention briefly, that prunes away these connections and gets you down to a biologically reasonable percentage. Then one needs to take into account the physiology as well. If you want your circuit to be not just a beautiful sculpture, but actually active, you need to build a physiology into it. And so you need to take into account the electrical diversity of the neuron types and also the diversity of the different synapses. Once you've taken all that into account, you can actually put a bunch of these microcircuits together and get a digital model of a piece of brain tissue that can actually react to input stimuli. So you can simulate the input coming from the thalamus to the somatosensory cortex. And so this is just to explain that the whole pruning process <laughs> for these superfluous connections is actually quite complex. and takes into account various biological parameters, such as the fact that you really need to have several synapses for a connection to be reliable between two neurons. In the end, what do you get? You get a beautifully reconstructed microcircuit. This example here is just showing a thousand of the neurons in the different uh, in the microcircuit. It's very small, as we see, because the, the sidebar there is showing just a thousand microns. There we see the whole, or a good piece of the circuit with roughly a thousand neurons represented, then some examples of the excitatory neurons, and then some examples of the inhibitory neurons. So that's the sort of thing that you get as a result of this kind of construction, a beautifully reconstructed microcircuit like this. And then you can actually, as I said, simulate input and simulate, see what happens as activity in reaction to that input. So that's how you go about constructing the blue brain model and the various experiments that one, one can run on it, or simulated experiments one can run. But what I'd like to talk about is the, the microcircuit as an experimental tool. So what is it good for? What you'd like to be able to study is what sort of structural and functional properties emerge when one goes through this process. Because a lot is known about, for certain pairs of neurons, about how they connect up. But if you think about the 55 times 55 possible pairs that you have to look at to study their connectivity, it's an enormous problem. And only a small fraction of those pairs of neurons, for only a small fraction of those pairs of neurons, is it known really how they connect and how they interact and so on. So sort of extrapolating from the little bit of real wet lab data that we have, you can sort of see, okay, what emerges when we try to put all of this together? So for example, you can see what different roles the different types of layers, the different types of neurons and connections play in the dynamics of the network, for example. Or one uh, observation that was made is that if you change the calcium concentration, in the cerebrospinal fluid, this changes dramatically the network dynamics of the circuit. When the calcium concentration is too low, the firing of the neurons is very sporadic, it's very chaotic, nothing special is happening, it's not a particularly good state for anything. If the calcium concentration is too high, then all the neurons sort of are marching together, and it's not particularly, it's more like epilepsy than anything else. You need to be a kind of a sweet spot in the calcium concentration to have your network really ready to learn. And what my team and I are doing within BlueBrain is to use the tools of algebraic topology in order to study the microcircuit in hopes of quantifying in a way that has been difficult to do up to now, both the structure and the function of these microcircuits, use a common language to describe them, and in general to be able to exploit such a quantitative description. So, one could easily say, well, first of all, what is algebraic topology? Because most people outside of mathematics don't know, and a bunch of many mathematicians don't actually know. And you could say, why does it have anything to do with neuroscience? So why algebraic topology? Besides the fact that I am an algebraic topologist, and anything that looks like a nail, well, so I have a hammer, so everything looks like a nail. But it's, that's not the only reason. Turns out that algebraic topology provides a fantastic mathematical filter through which we can look and discern a sort of order 
and structured organization in the brain that we can't see without this particular filter. So it turns out to be extremely useful that way. So it's sort of the next natural step after graph theory. So roughly 10 years ago or so, there were two neuroscientists, Patrick Hagman and Olaf Sporns, who roughly simultaneously came up with the idea of studying what they called the connectome, which is thinking about the brain as a sort of a graph or a network, either on the level of neurons and the connections between neurons, or on the level of brain regions and connections between brain regions. And so for about 10 years, this has been kind of a little cottage industry within neuroscience using graph theory the, to analyze the connectome at various levels, various scales. And no, algebraic topology sort of takes that one step further. So algebraic topology is that part of mathematics, which is really about notions of proximity, closeness, distance between things. Connectivity, it really is the mathematics of connectivity. So it's perfectly equipped for analyzing those sorts of notions in, in neuroscience. It's also the mathematics of what you could call local to global looking for emergent structures, looking for what kind of structure emerges globally from knowing, on what's go knowing what's going on locally in various places. So it's actually, for that reason, not an unreasonable choice to think about using this kind of mathematics when doing neuroscience. So connectivity, what do we mean by connectivity and how is this sort of notion supposed to help us? In what way does this come up in neuroscience? So the idea is that we should think about, we're going to try to abstract from this very complex network of neurons, connections between neurons, and so on, and find some sort of abstract representation of this complex structure that helps us to understand. An analogy that may help with understanding what the goal is here, think about the city of Tel Aviv. It's a complex city. I haven't seen very much of it so far. I hope to see more at some point. But in general, it's, if you want to figure out how to get around Tel Aviv, if you've never been here before like me, what do you do? You pull out your phone, you go to Google Maps, and you look at a map. A map is an abstract representation of a very complex interconnected structure. What you can think about what I'm doing here when I'm looking at applying the tools of algebraic topology to neuroscience, is I'm trying to make a map of the brain, of this complex structure. You're going to abstract away certain aspects that are not important for the moment, and just get to the heart of it and think about what's going on with connectivity. You're trying to navigate around Tel Aviv. You don't really care about which particular buildings are in your way if you're trying to get from A to B. You just care whether there's a series of roads that will take you from A to B. That's the kind of abstraction we're working with here. We also want to move beyond flatland. When people are thinking about graph theory. Graphs are very one-dimensional things, networks, very one-dimensional things, a sequence of points connected by line segments. But we want to move beyond that because it's a very low-dimensional representation of something that's very, very complex. So what we want to do is move to sort of a higher-dimensional representation of this same complex structure. So the idea of flatland goes back to this wonderful book by, well, Edwin Abbott pretending to be a square, a romance in many dimensions. So he talks about what it would be like if you lived on a point, or you lived on a line in something one-dimensional, or you lived in a plane, something was only two-dimensional, how the world would look to you, and how much of it you would miss if you were in those low dimensions. So for example, if you live in a plane, you don't know what a sphere is. You know what a circle is. A circle lives in a plane, but you don't know a sphere. A sphere lives in three dimensions. So what do you see if you're living in a plane and you see a sphere? The only way you can see a sphere in that case is if the sphere starts moving through the plane. So as it goes through the plane, first you see a point that grows and grows and grows to a larger circle, and then as the sphere continues going through the plane, then it shrinks again to a point. So the only way for uh, a square living in the plane to see a sphere as a progression of circles that goes from a point, circle, back to a point. So we want to move beyond this very one-dimensional perspective that we have when we're thinking about graph theory and take advantage of the fact that algebraic topology allows us to move beyond that to higher dimensional representations. So here we have a picture of two neurons who are talking to each other, who are connected. So 
a darker one and a lighter one there. And the points we see that are lit up there are where you have synapses, where an electrical signal is passing from one to the other. And the thing about these connections is that they're connections with direction. Electrical synapses go in one direction from the axon of one to, to the dendrite of the other. And when it's very important to take that very natural notion of direction into account when you're doing any kind of abstraction of the structure here. So what we're going to do when we abstract away from this very complex structure to thinking about something that can be analyzed with the tools of algebraic topology is to think about the fact that the connections between these two neurons always come with a sense of direction from what we call the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. So how does one represent direction? So this is showing a blow up of part of the microcircuit and the arrows that you see pointing from one neuron to another are indicating really the flow of the electrical signal from one to the other. So how do we represent this? Well, there's certain connections in networks that are given by called gap junctions that are just electrical connections where the signal can flow either way. We're not taking those into account for the time being. We're working with chemical synapses in which there really is a sense of direction from the presynaptic to the postsynaptic. And so instead of representing these just as a network with points connected by edges by what's called a graph, it's going to be what we call a digraph or directed graph where along each edge there's a sense of direction. So what we're going to try to, cap we're going to capture is that the fact that we're going to represent our network with the neurons being a bunch of points and the connections between them being edges or line segments with a sense of direction. Okay. So the word that you can't see there is directed simplices. What we're going to do now is take this network with a sense of direction on each edge and look at sort of higher and higher dimensional, larger and larger collections of neurons that all have the following property, that there is one neuron who's really the input neuron, the source neuron, and one neuron that's really the output neuron, or the sync neuron. So here we just have, here we have just an edge like this. This would be the source neuron, the presynaptic neuron. This would be the postsynaptic neuron, and this arrow indicates that there's a synapse, chemical synapse, linking them. And we call this a one-dimensional directed simplex because it's a line segment, which is just one dimensional. But there can be more neurons that are all working together to sort of funnel information from a source to a sink. For example, we can have this a two-dimensional representation. Here we have three neurons that are all working together. There's a source here, and the signal will flow from the source to the sink, perhaps via another one. And this makes us a, a triangle, which is now something that's two-dimensional. Or we could have four neurons that are all working together. Here we have a source, everything is flowing out from the source. And here we have a sink, everything is flowing into the sink. And there's always a unique sense of direction from the source to the sink. So we have all these neurons that are working together to funnel the information along. So these are different geometric abstract representations of bunches of neurons that are working together. And because people say, okay, up to three dimensions, that's fine, after that, it gets a little bit uh, hairy, show you that four dimensions is not that scary. So here we have five neurons that are working together, and it's going to make a four-dimensional structure now. We can't represent it as well in three dimensions, but again, we have the five neurons represented by these five points, and here we have a source neuron. Every, it, all the information is flowing out from the source. Here we have a sink neuron. Everything is flowing into the sink, and we have a unique, well-defined sense of direction at every moment along here, flowing from the source to the sink. All these neurons are working together to, to make the information flow along. So those are the mathematical pieces that we're studying. These are going to be the building blocks of the abstract representation, the mathematical representation that we're going to have of the microcircuit. We'll use these building blocks, look at how all these neurons are connected together, and it's going to make a beautifully complex geometric structure. So, what this graph shows is that there are, in fact, lots of these directed simplices in the microcircuit, and many, many more than you get in any sort of random circuit. So the blue curve here is, shows the number of these directed simplices, which, note, goes up to 
80 million. This is 8 times 10 to the 7th. And this is the dimension of the simplices we're looking at. So I showed you examples for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, but it goes on beyond that, all the way up to 7. So that's up to 8 different neurons that are all working together to ensure that the signal flows from a source to a sink like this. And the comparison that we made here was to either a graph that was completely random, they had the same connection probability as the microcircuit, had the same number of, uh, of neurons, but where the, the connection probability was completely random. And then we see that the structure is much less complex. We have many fewer simplices, and they die out very fast. Whereas here, we have up to 18 of these seven simplices. Here, there aren't any left after dimension three. Here, the reason I wanted to mention these curves here is we're doing comparison there with a reconstruction where the, it wasn't precise morphologies and exact connection probabilities are taken into account, but only average morphologies and average connection probabilities. And we see that when you don't take precise morphologies into account or exact connection probabilities, the structure you end up with is much less complex. So to maximize the complexity of your circuit, in measured in this particular geometric way, you really need to be, take these sort of very precise shapes into account. So this is our first ind indication that we could quantify the complexity of the circuit in this way, and that it gave us, it showed us that the structures we were getting were very different from what one get, would get in a random case. And then Henry, Markram, and Zeman went back to their wet lab, and they said, okay, let's look at actual tissue and see where we see such things. So they took slices from actual rat brains, did patch clamp experiments, and saw that if you did patch clamp experiments where you sampled up to 12 neurons, then you would again detect such simplices as well, even up to four simplices. So even when looking just at 12 neurons, Within those 12, you could find up to five of them that were connected in this directed way so that there was this unique sense of flow information from source to sink. Then we went back to the in silico and did simulated experiments of these, simulations of these patch clamp experiments and ended up with a similar looking distribution. So this, what this shows us is that probably we're even underestimating the structural complexity of the circuit. That once we, the microcircuit has been refined further, we'll probably see even more complex structure. And then the question is, well, does this structure have any real meaning? Is it really telling us about function? Because in the end, what we care a lot more about than simply structure is function, right? If we don't want to look at the brain in a jar, we want it to do something. So this is maybe a little more complex to understand, but it's not too bad. Here we're looking at, for the correlation in electrical activity. We're taking pairs of neurons in the microcircuit that are connected. So there's at least one edge between them. And the question we ask is, what is the largest simplex to which that edge belongs? It's called a maximal simplex. And what this graph shows is the larger the dimension of a simplex to which an edge belongs, the higher the correlation in electrical behavior between the two neurons. Which seems to indicate that, as Hillary Clinton once says, it takes a village. You want a whole bunch of neurons to work together. If you want two neurons to have correlated electrical behavior, it's best if they belong to a bigger family that's all working together to get the information from the source to the sink. So, for example, if we look at the red curve here, here we're looking at are simplices of various dimensions. And we're looking at the correlation electrical behavior between the sink, the last neuron, and the one just before it. And what we see is as dimension increases, the correlation increases as well. So this is the dimension of the largest simplex to which the edge belongs. But that happens as well if you're looking from the source to the next one or from the source to the sink, that the correlation increases. The blue here is the correlation between any pair of neurons that are within a simplex like this. The black line here is the mean correlation for an average pair of neurons that are connected. So we see that the correlation here is much higher than it would be if you just had an average pair of neurons. So that's interesting to observe. That you, you know, the higher the dimension goes, the more highly correlated the electrical behavior is. But it's also, I think, interesting to observe that, let's look down here, what this point here means. So what, that, what if I have, if I'm here at dimension one, 
That means that I have two neurons that are connected. And this edge doesn't belong to any larger simplex. It's just a little hair that's lost by itself. It's not part of anything bigger. So what this means is that if you're a connection that's not part of anything bigger, then your correlation is actually much lower than the average correlation. If you're just by yourself, you're not part of a bigger picture, then your chances of being correlated, even if you're connected, are not that high. You really have to be part of something bigger. So that indicates that these simplicities actually do have something important to say. Ten more minutes? Okay, thank you. So, let's think more deeply about function. And with any chance, this will... Okay. Never mind. This was supposed to be a video, but apparently it doesn't work. No. Okay. So, if you actually stimulate the circuit, and you look at what happens with activity, then you have a wave of activity spreading across this, and it's a very beautiful, complex pattern of things lighting up, and the lighting going, and so on. And it's very lovely to watch, but to quantify what's going on is extremely difficult. And it turns out that using these same tools that allowed us to quantify the structural complexity of the circuit, we can also, also quantify the functional connectivity of the circuit and say something about how the topology or the structure that we detected in, uh, in the circuit influences then its reaction to, to activity. So, how are we going to apply these same tools to analyzing activity? The idea is that we're going to stimulate the network, look at how the activity moves through it, and then we have a sort of a movie of activity. And we're going to break it into snapshots, snapshots of like 10 milliseconds. And in each bin of 10 milliseconds, we're going to see which connections are active at that time. And that will give us actually a subgraph of the original graph that we're interested in. And then we can apply the same tools that we're applying in the structural circuit to each particular snapshot. It's like we have a movie in which we have the different frames, and we're analyzing frame by frame what's going on with the activity. So that's our approach here, by dividing over five millisecond time bins. And we have what we call the transmission response rule. So it just says that we're going to include an edge if the presynaptic neuron fires in that time bin, and the postsynaptic one fires within a reasonable time then you say that that edge is actually there. So this picture here is showing us one particular snapshot. So here we have the whole circuit right here. And anytime we see a yellow edge there, that means that that connection is actually active. And here we've just sort of zoomed into layer five of the circuit. Each little dot is, an, is a neuron, and each yellow line there is an edge that happened to be active in that particular time bin, time bin. So what we do is we analyze this particular subgraph of the original graph, and that gives us a time series of graphs. The way, so we set up the experiment as follows. We consider simulated experiment. We consider nine different possible stimuli, which are then input into the circuit. We see how the different neurons react. We can make raster plots of the spiking behavior and see, you know, what the, the how well correlated the reactions are for these different neurons. Here we have an example of a fire, uh, four simplex that is located in the microcircuit going from down up here in layer one or two down to layer two rather, down to layer five. So this is often larger simplices are structured like this. And then we try, we have these nine different input patterns that we consider. So the way we analyze this is by going beyond just simplex counts once you have a set of building blocks, if you were a child with a set of building blocks, you build complex structures. And you're interested in things like building a castle. And when you build your castle, you have, your castle has different rooms, it has windows, it has things like that. And so the, when we take this microcircuit, we look at the associated directed simplices. Those are our building blocks. We put them together, we build complex structures. And some of these structures are cavities, like windows or like rooms in the castle. So here we have a particular cavity like a window, made of 4-1 simplices. More complicated cavities can be built. For example, we have here, this is a hollow cavity here. It's built from eight different two simplices that have been glued together, like this, to make something that's hollow on the inside. That's what we would call a two-dimensional cavity. 
what we're interested in is counting the number of these cavities. They're very complex structures, and the more of these cavities you have of higher dimensions, the, higher, the more complex your structure is. So that's another something we're going to count, what we call the Betty numbers. The second Betty number, for example, is the number of two-dimensional cavities that you have in your structure. So when we do this analysis, looking at sort of movie of activity with frame by frame by frame by frame, it gives us a time series of these different invariants. Here we're measuring the number of one simplices. Here this is the number of one-dimensional cavities, like that window I showed you, the number of three-dimensional cavities, and then something called the Euler characteristic, which is an alternating sum of the numbers of simplices as time passes. And here the different colors are the different kinds of stimuli we were looking at. But that's not a particularly helpful way to look at it. Instead, we decided to plot this value here, the number of one-dimensional cavities, against this number here, which is the number of three-dimensional cavities. And when you do that, you have the following beautiful picture that comes up. So here we were considering three different stimuli in the same rat. And we see there's a certain pattern through time where the number of one-dimensional one cavities increases, and then as it starts decreasing, the number of three-dimensional cavities increases until suddenly it drops. So we have this sort of growing complexity of the one simplicities that goes like this, and then it's processing. So one can analyze this in different ways. That was three different stimuli in the same rat. You can also look at different rats. But I also want to show you one where we see how the activity is moving through the circuit at different points here until it all dies away. So these Betty numbers give us a way of quantifying activity as well as as structure. So there are various questions we can go into. What about plasticity? Could we use more sophisticated topology? And I also wanted to say we've been using topology to look at models for, for uh, <coughs> neuron morphologies, for classifying them and for synthesizing them. I want to thank all of the collaborators. This, a project like this takes collaborators across a wide range of areas, everything from topology through computer science to neuroscience, a large team all working together and we, to end up with an article that was finally published last summer. And last but not least, happy birthday, David. I think it'd be very interesting to look at those sorts of VLSI circuits, for example, and analyze, go beyond just looking at the two-dimensional structures, because if you just take the connectivity of these things, you can actually see these higher dimensions. People just haven't been doing it. They haven't been looking at those things, but they're there. And it could be a very interesting thing to analyze, absolutely. Oh, we're definitely not at semantics yet. The, no. So the point is that this is just giving us a new filter through which to look and actually be able to say something quantitative. Because if we look back at this, the fact that independently of the input stimulus, so we always get this same sort of stereotypical behavior of increasing complexity until you reach the point at which, you know, the, the information is now processed, you've finished your information processing. What this means is that, okay, this gives us something on which we can focus as these are structures in which we need to look, that these are perhaps a structure, this is perhaps part of a, the code that the brain uses in order to encode and decode information. But it's a long way away. It's just a, a new perspective that is giving us, shedding some new light on common behavior in the brain. <laughs>
tell us much about the synapses. What happens there? I mean, in your model, is there a strength of the synapse? Or maybe I misunderstood. Okay, so for the time being, we haven't taken the strength of synapses into account. It's been simply binary. Does it exist? Does it not exist? But now, well, but now we are taking this into account. So the, it was first an approximation to say, okay, so we just take into account whether or not there's a synapse. And now we're taking the weights of the syna strengths of the synapses into account. The patterns, if there are no synaptic strength, I mean, everything is the same strength. Right, so you've, the structure doesn't depend on the strength, but the way we're seeing the activity, the activity certainly depends on the strength. And for the time we're going to do, now we're going to take these weights into account and do an analysis which is going to give us some sort of now three-dimensional representation and not just two-dimensional, taking the weights into account when we talk about plasticity.